Crimson Rivers, Ice It's starting to get really cold, Peter whispers, hunching over on himself in the middle of the cave by the small, crackling fire with his arms wrapped around his center as he presses himself forward into his bent legs. James exhales shakily and sees his breath slightly fog out in front of him. As the evening starts inching towards night, it's growing so cold that it's a legitimate concern. Next to him, Vanity is rattling so hard that her teeth are chattering, and she's practically touching the fire with how close to it she is. Y you know, Vanity says through her shivers, my m mentor said uh, that f freezing is the l leading cause of d death in the arena, so it's n not looking good f for us. Oh, ye of little faith, James mumbles, his fingers numb to the point they're prickling. Get over here, Peter. Like it pains him, Peter shuffles over with a shudder, nodding when James gestures for him to sit down on the other side of Vanity to box her in between their bodies. They all scoot closer to the fire, simultaneously, without even talking about it, holding their hands out to leech off the heat. Vanity presses tight to her sides, still shivering violently. J James... Vanity wheezes. If the, the, the temperature drops even more, it's n not looking g good for me. Hey, we'll warm you up, all right? James says softly, nudging her shoulder with his own. Me and Pete, we'll keep the fire going all night, yeah? Promise. Maybe freezing is the leading cause of death, but not for you, okay? Your mentor was just trying to prepare you, is all. Vanity gives a tight, jerky nod. She was really kind to me, and Hodge gave us r really good advice. Wait, Hodge? Peter asks curiously. He was the other one reaped with you? <laughs> Vanity hums. Who's your mentor? Peter murmurs. M Merlene McKinnon, Vanity stutters out. James blinks in surprise. Sirius had, of course, been very forthcoming about everything he knew and learned about his fellow mentors, as well as their tributes, but in some cases, there wasn't very much to tell. Some mentors are tight-lipped about these things, especially if they know what's good for them, or so Sirius said, because letting the wrong information slip to the wrong person could be the cause of their tributes dying. Sirius did mention Merlene, though, but he had very little to say other than the fact that she had two young tributes this year, who would, more likely than not, die very quickly. Yeah, Marlene McKinnon, James comments gently, watching the small, fond smile flicker on Vanity's face. There's admiration there, and it makes James's heart clench. Sirius talked about her a lot to us. He's my mentor. Well, he's my best friend, but also my mentor, technically. I n no, Vanity says, sounding exasperated as she rolls her eyes despite her shivering. Everyone knows. James huffs a weak laugh, leaning over into her a little harder, grateful when Peter does the same. They're practically squishing her between them at this point, fighting valiantly to make her warmer. Right, well, Sirius told us how amazing she was, you know? And they're friends, he said. You know what that means, don't you? What? what? Vanity asks, looking up at him. That means it only makes sense that we're friends too, James tells her with a gentle curl of his lips. At this, Vanity cracks a beaming smile, even while her teeth chatter. She turns and presses her grin into Peter's shoulder, stuttering out a laugh, and Peter laughs along with her. The night carries on, growing colder with each passing minute, to the point that they're all shivering violently, and Vanity has nearly stopped, which, James knows, is actually a very bad sign. She's fallen asleep, and that makes him anxious, but he keeps stalking the fire and rubbing one of her hands between both his palms, while Peter does the same to the other. At some point, Peter rasps. James? Yeah? James asks, looking over at him. Peter has a pained look on his face, and he drops his gaze down to Vanity before carefully glancing up again. James instantly shakes his head, refusing, before Peter even says it. 
No, no, Peter. She's, I know it doesn't look good, but she, she'll, James, Peter Moore insistently says, looking heartbroken. She's making it to morning, James snaps, his voice firm, and he rubs her hand harder. It feels like ice between his palms. Peter opens and closes his mouth, face twisting, and then he looks away without saying a word. He shakily adds another twig to the fire, eyebrows furrowed in the orange glow that bathes over his features and dances on the cave walls. James looks at Vanity, his chest cramped with concern. At that moment, a cannon goes off, making James jolt and go tense all over. The first thing he thinks is immediately Regulus. Then, following that, he flings a hand up to cup the side of Vanity's neck to try and see if she has a pulse. She's still shivering, just not as much, and her breath hits his arm. It's worryingly slow, but it's there. Is she... Peter can't seem to finish. Yeah, she's... She's alive. She's going to live, James says with a deep exhale, dragging his gaze back up to Peter's as he drops his hand to go back to warming Vanity's stiff fingers again. Five, Peter breathes out, turning his head to look over at the mouth of the cave. Who do you think? I don't know, James croaks, utterly fretful, his stomach cramping as his fear and anxiety spikes. Not him, please not him. He swallows harshly. I really don't know. Regulus stares up at the sky, though his vision is repeatedly obscured by his every exhale. A billow of white smoke that drifts up every time his breath leaves his numb lips. He's shivering all over, so cold that he's aching. The sky is littered with stars. It feels like being mocked. There are no constellations that he recognizes, as if the sky was designed without them, just nameless stars hanging like props in the sky, not real. Even still, Regulus stares up at the brightest one and imagines it's serious anyway. The cave, which feels literally like a fucking glacier, isn't exactly the best place to be right now, honestly, but he doesn't have much of a choice. He's lying back on the curve of the top on the roof, above the midpoint inside the cave. His back, fortunately, came with an emergency blanket, which is probably his only saving grace at the moment. He's wrapped up in it, trapping the minimal heat he's capable of inside with him. It's possibly the only thing standing between him and death right now. There's a variety of deaths surrounding him at all sides, which isn't just him being dramatic. Come on, Black, no point in hiding. Case in point, that. Regulus would scoff if he could, but he's genuinely too cold to manage it. He doesn't even bother to turn his head, already knowing what he'll see. Mulsiber, Avery, Bernice, Hodge, and Quinn are exactly where he saw them last, standing on the other side of the river with rocks in hand, a large fire burning to keep them all warm. Will and Axes haven't returned yet, and the most recent cannon, the fifth death, rings in his ears. He hopes it wasn't Evan. He refuses to think it was James. The Death Eaters, upon discovering him across the Crimson River, had immediately begun heckling him. It didn't take very long to start pelting him with rocks, chasing him around to no end. Going inside the cave didn't work, because Bernice and Avery have freakishly good aim. The only thing that kept him from being stoned to death was scrambling up the cave where they couldn't get the proper angle to hit him. That doesn't mean they haven't stopped heckling him, though. There were a few breaks in between, of course, pausing long enough to start a fire when the temperature dropped and continues to drop, for example. But they always resumed. It's been everything from taunting him to threatening him to trying to bait him into coming back down. At one point, Mulsiber even dared him to throw one of his daggers, try to get a shot in, but Regulus knows better than that. He's not putting a weapon in their hands, not for anything. It crossed his mind, of course, to just toss all the weapons and supplies into the river so no one could get to them, but he's wary to do it for multiple reasons.
He doesn't know how this time in the arena will go, and this is only the first day, so he'll be quite furious with himself if he needs something in the future and can't get it because he already tossed it. Furthermore, the game maker surely won't like it, and he's not willing to give them more reasons to target him than he already has. On top of that, throwing everything away into the river would only be possible if the others aren't around to throw rocks at him. He's still considering it, if the Death Eaters fall asleep, but even still, he thinks he'd have to be in a very bad emotional state and completely desperate before he tossed away supplies and weapons that could be useful in the future. Avery, the idiot, had tried to recruit him, said they'd spare his life if he'd provide them with weapons and supplies. Just throw it over to them. Regulus had told him to fuck off, just like James, but he definitely wasn't polite about it. At first, Regulus had mocked them back, taunted them, did everything he could to rile them up and infuriate them, which was probably stupid, but it's not like they could get to him, and honestly, he'd sort of childishly relished in it. But as more time passed, Regulus fell silent and stopped engaging, and now he's far too cold to speak. Technically, Regulus has the advantage. He has all the weapons and supplies at his fingertips. That doesn't mean shit, though, when he can't make a retreat or even access any of the weapons or supplies without rocks being thrown at him. He dodged and outran most, but a few clipped him, so he'll no doubt have various bruises blooming by tomorrow. Yet, the threat of the Death Eaters seems so inconsequential compared to that of the Elements. Regulus is genuinely worried that he's going to freeze to death by morning. It's so cold out now that he thinks a lot of the smaller people are going to freeze to death, frankly. Maybe someone already has. There's a fifth person dead. Who or how remains to be seen. It doesn't help that Regulus can't start a fire on the cave. He has matches, but nothing to keep the fire going, so here he is, shaking like a leaf and scowling up at the sky. If he dies like this, he's going to fucking riot. Hey, hey, do you see this? The river is frozen over, Avery abruptly shouts, and Regulus freezes. Well, he freezes as much as he can when he's shivering so violently. Do you think, you try it, get fucked, you try it. Regulus scrambles up frantically, rolling up his blanket to shove into his bag as he flips over. He's still very cold and stiff, but the way adrenaline floods his nervous system and how his blood starts to pump really spurs him into action. He crawls further up the cave, staying low, dagger in hand. He reaches the peak, just in time to see Mulciber grab Hodge by the arm and shove him towards the river, snapping, "'Well, go on then. See if it holds.' Hodge stares hesitantly at the river, his arms wrapping around himself, and Regulus tips his head down to examine it as well. It's still a vivid red, even in the dark, but a thick film of ice is layered over the top, almost making it look pink underneath. Slowly, looking utterly terrified, Hodge shuffles towards the edge of the river. He doesn't move for a long moment, and Bernice steps forward to shove him into the back of the shoulder roughly spurring him into motion. Regulus tenses when Hodge reaches the river and slowly, oh so slowly, pokes his foot out to press the very tip of his shoe against the ice. Immediately, pale hands smack up against the bottom, making Hodge yelp and stumble back, but the hands don't break through the surface. They just rest in place for a moment, then retreat again, disappearing into the depths. Oh yeah, that's how we get across, Avery declares a feral grin spreading across his face. Regulus sees his body tense, his foot pressing into the ground, and then he starts running, carelessly sprinting right onto the ice and ignoring the hands that bang up against the ice beneath him. All right, Regulus has seen enough. Surging around, Regulus launches to his feet and takes off running, nearly tripping down the decline of the cave as it slopes down to solid ground. He manages to keep his balance and use the stumble to give him further momentum, throwing himself forward with everything he has in him. He's running! Weapons! Weapons! Get the weapons first, for fuck's sake! Malsabur roars. Avery! Avery! You fucking... Regulus doesn't look back or let himself hesitate as he darts onto the iced-over river. 
hearing the hands that pound beneath his feet, trying to get to him and not stopping for a second. With his bag on his back and his daggers close, Regulus skids around the ice until he makes it to solid ground on the other side, and then he goes barreling right into the forest. Someone, Avery no doubt, doesn't stop to get weapons and instead continues to give chase, not letting up or slowing down. Regulus makes it into the forest and goes crashing further inside, barely able to see where he's going, but he hasn't been beside a warm fire for the last few hours. He hasn't had any water. To be fair, neither have the Death Eaters. But he also hasn't been lazing about all day. Despite being so fast, how cold he is and his exhaustion are very serious issues. Those that mean Avery manages to catch up to him. Regulus knows he's close. He can hear it. He's trying to outrun it, but it's no use. Avery slams into his back and takes him down to the ground, and Regulus lands with a harsh thud. He rolls frantically with the motion, attempting to shove Avery off of him, but Avery just scrambles to get on top of him. He straddles Regulus, slapping at the ground, and then he raises his hand in the dark and strikes Regulus in the face. Avery is holding a rock, a big one, a cold stone that slices Regulus's cheek open and clips him on the lip hard enough to make the corner of his mouth bleed. Regulus can taste it on his tongue, the thick weight of salt and iron and rust. It's disgusting, honestly, but he swallows it in favor of breathing, because he can't exactly spit it out at this moment. Breathing hard, Avery seems to grasp the rock better with both hands, lifting it high up above his head, and Regulus becomes abruptly aware that he's about to get his skull bashed in. The world doesn't slow down with his impending death. If anything, it seems to speed up, and Regulus's brain fails to keep up. His body has no such issues, though. It's reflexive, just immediate instinct. Regulus throws his leg up to knee Avery harshly between his legs, making him fold forward with a groan and then he swings his hand up and buries the dagger in Avery's throat, all the way to the hilt. Avery makes a choking noise. Regulus can see him in perfect detail, even in the dark. He can see the way he's frozen, his arms still raised like he's a puppet on strings he hasn't realized have been snipped yet. His eyes are wide with shock, mouth opening and closing as no sound comes out. And then... Regulus wretches the blade back out with a deep, heaving breath. Avery's arms fall, the rock hitting the ground with a thud. His eyes are glassy, and they're visibly dimming, going dull. When Regulus tilts and pushes on him, Avery slumps to the side, blood pouring from his throat. Before Regulus even stands, the cannon sounds, and Avery doesn't move anymore. Avery isn't breathing anymore. Avery has that unnatural stillness that comes from a lack of life, because he's dead. Regulus just killed him. The world seems to warp in and out as Regulus stares at Avery's body, frozen in place and wide-eyed. It doesn't really come back into focus until he hears pounding feet on the forest floor heading right for him. Swallowing thickly, Regulus glances at Avery for one more second, all too aware of the blood that drips from his blade, from the very tips of his fingers, and then he turns on the spot and keeps running. He doesn't look back. James is the one who stays up even when Peter falls asleep. Vanity is curled up against him, and they've moved so close to the fire that it's probably technically a hazard, but the warmth has seemed to help. She's shivering again and breathing more deeply, which James takes as a good sign. Still, to keep the fire going, wood is a necessity, so he drags himself up to brave the cold alone. It's laid out now, the moon hanging high in the sky, and James's eyes are itchy with the need to sleep. He won't be able to, though, not until he finds out who's dead, and, more importantly, who isn't. There's six now. Another cannon went off for the sixth a few hours ago, briefly making James panic when he thought Vanity wasn't breathing, but she was. She's strong. She's a fighter, and she'll fight her way to morning, until it's warm again. 
that doesn't mean James's panic overall has gone away, because it hasn't. And it won't until he's absolutely sure that Regulus is alive. James thinks he is. Oddly, he thinks he, well, he just feels like he would know somehow. Just fundamentally. More accurately, James knows he's not going to be fully okay until he sees Regulus again. He needs to. As soon as tomorrow, James is going to find him. Because how the fuck can he get him home if he's not right by his side the entire time? Vanity has Peter now to look after her until James gets back with Regulus firmly in tow. Tomorrow, James will find him. Outside, the cave is awful. Harsh. Just absolutely fucking brutal. It's so cold that his frame rattles like his skeleton is vibrating in an attempt to shed his flesh like a particularly stiff coat. James dugs his head down and grits his teeth again, planning to make it quick, only gathering the first few sticks he comes across. They just need enough to make it to morning. James has a tiny armful and is just about to go back into the shelter of the cave. Not the best, but better than nothing, for sure. But then there's the sound of trumpets and horns that make him drop all the sticks as he whirls around. He tilts his head up towards the sky, wide-eyed as he watches the banners of the fallen tributes begin. Please, 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 James chants under his breath. It plays out in the order that they died. First, there's someone James doesn't know, one of the ones that refused to talk to anyone, and despite this, his heart still aches when their face hovers in the sky. Following that is a child, yet another one that James didn't know, but a child all the same. Can't be more than 17 years old. A lump forms in his throat. The third looks to be older, which doesn't make it much easier, honestly. But James remembers when she fell into the river, mere moments before Vanity nearly did the same. The fourth, James recognizes the fourth. His breath punches out of him, a harsh clench clamping down on his chest as he stares up at Dylan's face in the sky. Dylan, only 21, a best friend at home that will never get him back. Dylan, who didn't have much of a family outside his best friend. Who was so good at starting fires, like he always wanted to keep people around him warm. James swallows harshly and feels his shoulders sag, trying not to let himself think about how it happened. How it might not have happened if James had been there. A mere few days ago, Dylan was smiling at him shyly, and now he'll never smile again. The fifth isn't anyone he recognizes either. Another child, though. Very, very young. Heartbreakingly young. It's enough to make tears spring to his eyes, because between that and Dylan, he can't stop himself from feeling terribly upset. The tears sting his cheeks as they fall. Maybe they'll freeze there. The sixth. James blinks as he stares up at Avery's face, admittedly startled by this one. The Death Eaters. That doesn't make any sense. James can't work out why Avery would be dead. Quinn or Hodge, maybe, because they're the ones the Death Eaters will dispose of first. Avery wouldn't stray far from the rest of the group, so it would be hard to kill him. At least, not without the others rushing to kill whoever tried. Did he fall into the river? Eat the wrong plant? It's just baffling. The sky grows dark again, and James bows his head, exhaling shakily as he gently closes his eyes. Irene is alive. Matthias is alive. Evan is alive. Vanity and Peter are alive. Yes, so is Malsiber, Bernice, Axis, Willa, Quinn, and Hodge, but that hardly matters. What matters the most? Regulus is alive. He's still alive. He's still out there. James lifts his head and looks up at the sky, entertaining the thought that maybe, just maybe, Regulus is doing the same, just as relieved to know that James is alive too. Just stay alive, I'll find you, James whispers on an exhale, then dips down to scoop the sticks back up and go back into the cave, a new weight lifted off his shoulders. Sirius regrettably remembers his first day in his games. It had been designed like a mountain, hills everywhere, the very top where the weapons and supplies were. 
There were a lot of trees, but they were thin and not the kind one would climb. The only shelter to hide in was the random cabins placed all over, completely gutted and offering no comforts, usually without doors as well. On his first day, he spent it curled up in a tiny room in one of those cabins, cooking the rat he'd managed to catch and barely getting any rest. Sirius didn't kill anyone on his first day. No, that came later. Well, rather soon, actually. He killed two people on his second day, four on his third, three on his fifth, and one on his sixth, none on his seventh and eighth, then the final two on his ninth. Twelve people in less than two weeks. Serious black, everybody. Regulus has killed someone before the night is even over. Rather against his will, Sirius remembers each of his kills in the arena, every single one in excruciating detail, so vivid that he can close his eyes and transport himself right back to those moments, even ten years later. Sometimes that happens to him anyway, especially in his dreams. It happened a lot more often in the first few years after the arena, completely out of his control, usually hallucinations that James had to talk him out of, a few times, Sirius was so out of it that he'd nearly hurt James because he was back there, or because he wasn't free from his own head. James never blamed him for it, and Sirius will never forgive himself for it. What a pair they are, eh? Sirius's first kill, though, Gunther Billoughby, 23 years old, coming right at 16-year-old Sirius Black with a mace on his chain made of steel swinging it at Sirius's head with wild and frightening precision. Sirius had nothing but the wooden spear he'd carved sloppily for himself the first night with a sharp piece of stone. Nothing could remove the memory from his brain of taking that spear and shoving it right through Gunther's eye, all the way down until Gunther finally stopped moving. The flimsy spear had broken off into his skull, so Sirius picked up the mace before he walked away from his first kill. Ten minutes later, he was back in his cabin, staring at the blood on his hands and rocking back and forth as he struggled to remember how to breathe. He never did really catch his breath after that, and he doesn't think he's breathed the same since. Sirius wonders, as he watches his brother on the screen, if he feels as fundamentally altered as Sirius did after his first kill. Not his last, and certainly not his worst, but there's something about that very first one. It's damaging. You can't come back after that. The first one is where it all starts. And yes, the ones that follow aren't easier or less impactful, but, well, the first one has weight. It's a permanent weight, in fact. One you can't shake. That shift from something innocent to a killer. Because you've killed someone now, and you can't ever change that. It doesn't matter if you weren't really innocent before. Murder rips out the soul. And Sirius is a shredded tapestry. But he remembers the brutality of that first tear. Regulus has successfully evaded the remaining Death Eaters by taking refuge in a tree. Not up in a tree, but literally inside a tree. He'd found one with a hollowed-out trunk a small space he could tuck himself into, and he's curled up into it now. The Death Eaters ran past him a while ago now, and they're not circling back. They're not going to, as far as Sirius can tell. They're settling down for the night, trying to get some sleep. Meanwhile, Regulus is scrubbing furiously at his trembling hands, despite the fact that he's cleaned all the blood off already. His dagger, too. There is no more blood, but Regulus continues to frantically try to scrub it all away, like he's still seeing it there. Sirius' heart breaks, because he knows what that feels like. He knows what it is to look at your hands and see them stained with blood permanently. The only thing that seemed to bring Regulus comfort was the fact that James's face wasn't splayed on a banner in the sky. He'd watched avidly, stiff and frozen in place, and at the end, all the tension had drained out of his body for a brief moment. Sirius knew he was relieved about James, and possibly Evan too. Still, he hadn't been able to see Avery's face in the sky. As soon as it appeared, he'd looked away and went right back to trying to clean his already clean hands. 
Eventually, the cold seemed to catch up to Regulus as he curls up inside the tree, wrapped up in his blanket and looking so, so small. There is a camera in there, of course, so it's easy to see the anguish in his eyes that don't drift shut. Yeah, he's probably not sleeping tonight. As for James, he's fine with Vanity and Peter. Sirius isn't entirely sure that Vanity will make it through the night, but for her sake, as well as James and Marlene's, he hopes she does. At the moment, Peter has woken up again to take the next shift so James can get some sleep. But James is telling him about the six people who died on the first day. But really, that's all. The games aren't televised 24-7. The tributes do have to sleep, and there's generally a lot of time where they're just casually surviving. Nothing interesting to the Hallows. So it's not long before it's coming to an end as various tributes settle in for the night. Sirius grabs the remote and watches the screen go black. For a long moment, he just sits there in silence, trying to make sense of all that's happened already. James, who is with Peter and Vanity, essentially weaponless and taking care of those who Sirius uncharitably, but realistically, doesn't suspect will make it very far. James can drag them, kicking and screaming, but it's only going to hold him back, too. That's a fucked up way to think, and James won't think that way at all, but it's about facts. About survival. James is carrying around dead weight, and if he does it too long, he will sink. Then there's Regulus, who, to serious surprise and mild despair, has been busy so far. Day one, and he's already done so much that it's hard to organize it all. There is the bond he seems to form with Evan which, again, Sirius did not see coming. Not so soon. Maybe not a secure bond, but a shaky foundation of trust, nonetheless. In the arena, things like that can get you far. Case in point, Regulus. He has weapons and surprise. He worked hard to get them, too. Sirius finds the riffer around the cave indescribably cruel. He's never seen any arena do something like that before. Horace Slughorn is a sick, creative bastard to think up something like that. It's also meticulously designed, the terrain reliant upon the water. They need the ice to make it across the river, and the drop in temperature also works against them. They don't have it easy this year. Sirius will admit to nearly having 80 heart attacks while watching Regulus get to the weapons and supplies, knowing he's afraid of heights but still doing all of that anyway, and also not being entirely sure about Evan's intentions. Yeah, Sirius was holding his breath the whole time, basically. It was so close, too. That's the tragedy of it all. Regulus and Evan nearly made it. Almost, almost, almost. The most devastating word in the world. Fucking almost. Watching Regulus get discovered, then get rocks thrown at him, that was hard. Sirius flinched each time Regulus was hit, or nearly hit. That didn't even compare to the absolute horror and dread that stole over him when the Death Eaters realized they could get to Regulus, and then Avery. For one brief, terrifying moment, Sirius had been so sure that Regulus was about to be killed. Avery struck Regulus with a rock, after all. It had left him with a split lip and a thankfully small cut on his cheek. Nothing that won't scab over and heal fairly quickly. But in that split second, when Regulus was just there on the ground, Sirius's heart had nearly fucking given out from the stress. He was relieved instantly, instinctively, when Regulus killed Avery with little to no hesitation. Still, it makes Sirius feel hollow and exhausted to know that Regulus did it, that he had to. Sirius was under no illusion that Regulus and James would make it through the arena without killing people. They're targets, so there's just no chance of that, honestly. That doesn't mean it's easy. That doesn't mean it doesn't rip Sirius up inside. Sirius? Exhaling shakily, Sirius sits the remote aside and glances over at Remus, who is still here. Remus, who stayed. Remus, who held his hand no matter how hard Sirius squeezed it. Remus, who murmured encouragement and endless reassurance in Sirius's ears the entire time. Remus, who never judged him for any sound of distress he made, or for every flinch he gave. 
or for any tears that he had to blink away. Remus, Remus, Remus. I need a drink, Sirius says hoarsely, peeling himself up from the seat to shuffle towards the kitchen. Remus follows him. He's quiet and watchful as Sirius draws out a glass, grabs a bottle, and pours himself some scotch. Something briny, smoky, a curl of the sea set on fire in his throat. It's heavy, but his tolerance is, well, it takes a lot for him to get inebriated which comes from consistently doing a lot in the past. But sometimes just the whole ritual of it can have a soothing effect on it. Get the glass, pour the drink, drink it, feel a bird at his chest. Routine, or it used to be. Sirius heaves a sigh and sits down the glass after his second pull from it, feeling himself squint. He always feels... Guilty when it comes to his self-destructive behaviors of the past. Not all of it was his fault, but he's responsible for some of it, and it's probably one of the bigger reasons he doesn't spiral out of control again. Well, that and James. Regulus, too, he thought at one point in time, but he doesn't try to fool himself thinking that way anymore. It's not like he did anything with his sobriety. Even when Sirius managed to get sober, with James's help and support, and stay sober, he didn't go to his brother to make things right. Regulus barely even knew how bad off Sirius was, honestly. Besides, not being sober wasn't ever the source of his and Regulus's issues. Maybe just a small reason behind the true issues, but that was all. Remus doesn't say anything, but he leans up against the table with his arms crossed over his chest fingers cupping his own elbows. It's almost like he's holding himself. Sirius has the most ridiculous urge to just duck down and sneak up in between those arms, so they'll hold him too. Well, Sirius says eventually, he holds up his glass in front of his face and narrows his eyes at the liquid inside, studying how it moves in the patterned crystal glass. In the light of the kitchen, the scotch is the same color as Remus's eyes. They're alive, Remus murmurs. Yeah, Sirius agrees quietly. He takes in a deep, shuddering breath and reminds himself that they're alive has to be the most important thing. He can't linger on what it costs, what it takes, for that to be true. Later, when they're in front of him, no, when one of them is in front of him, because it can't be both, fuck. When one of them is in front of him, Alive, but not well for all the ways in which they had to survive, if they do. If one of them does, only one. And the odds, Sirius squeezes his eyes shut and drains his glass, hissing through the burn and sitting the glass down with a thunk. He does the mental equivalent of slapping his own mind to get it in order, focusing it to be still for one fucking second. When one of them is home, if they make it home, then Sirius will worry about the repercussions of all of it, of all that it took to make that happen. The priority first, and always, is they're alive. He can't think about Regulus, alone and cold inside the trunk of a tree. He can't think about James, hungry and cold inside the cave. He can't think about what they've already suffered, or what they're going to suffer as each day passes until the end. The only thing he can think about is that they're alive. They're still alive, and how he can help make sure that they stay that way. Sirius, Remus says gently, and fingers wrap around the glass in Sirius's hand, overlapping with his, starting to pull it from his grip. Sirius snatches his hand away, eyes blinking open as he harshly snaps, Don't! There's a moment, a brief stillness, where their eyes are locked and nothing... Nothing at all is happening. Something shifts in Remus's gaze, and then something is happening, but Sirius doesn't know what it is. In the next second, Remus reaches out to grab Sirius's wrist firmly, not enough to hurt, just enough for Sirius to feel it. He doesn't let go. Give me the glass, Sirius, Remus tells him. No, Sirius bites out, bitchy about it. No, I'll keep it, thanks. And just who are you to tell me? I'm your... Remus falters. Only briefly, then huffs, I am important to you, am I not? Or am I just a fucking servant to you? Sirius blinks, 
admittedly smacked right out of his bad mood for a moment to be very bewildered and said, Um, what? You heard me, Remus says sharply. Do I or do I not have a right to be concerned about you? Someone very dear to you, that's what you said. But what? Just a servant who gets no say when it's convenient for you. Is that it? I, what? No, fucking, of course not, no. Sirius spits out in a mixture of disbelief and anger, actually. Genuine anger that Remus would think that of him. I fucking hell, Remus. It's is now the best time for this, really? It's the best time when I say it's time. Give me the fucking glass, Sirius, Remus snaps. All right, Sirius bursts out, mildly incredulous and also baffled and agitated and tense, and he gives Remus the glass. Remus sits it aside, then drops Sirius' wrist. I have every right to care about you. You gave me that right, and I'm not letting it go. Especially not when you're hurting. You're upset. You're under an unimaginable amount of stress right now. If you want to challenge me, that's fine, but I won't back down. It was one fucking drink, Remus. Sirius grumbles, and Remus just arches an eyebrow at him. It was. I'm not a child. I know moderation, all right? I can have one drink, or even a few more, and it doesn't have to mean, but it does mean. Today, it will mean. This week, when they're in the arena, it's going to mean. Remus cuts in, and Sirius clenches his jaw, because he's right. And I'm not, I'm not blaming you, Sirius. I'm not judging you. What you're going through right now, I wouldn't ever hold it against you, how you handle it. But he swallows, his face softening. But I won't stand by and do nothing, if I can help. I know there is nothing I can do to fix what's wrong. I know that, but if I can be here for you and take care of you, then I'm going to. And nothing, not even you, will stop me from trying. Sirius feels a lump form in his throat, and he just wants it to go away. He's so tired of feeling choked. He's so tired of having things repeatedly shoved down his throat. One horrible thing right after the other, until all he can do is choke. He wants to drown it all out, dull the senses, and swallow it down until it rises back up like bile when he gets clear-headed. Remus reaches out as if he's about to touch Sirius's hand, and Sirius reflexively pulls away from it. Remus's hand retreats immediately, and Sirius chokes on that too. Sorry, Sirius rasps. I'm sorry, I'm just... You don't have to apologize, Remus murmurs. Of course you don't, Sirius. If you don't want me to touch you, then you don't. You can pull away. You can tell me no. You can have boundaries, even in respecting mine. It just... I just feel so... I feel raw, Sirius confesses, the words retching out of him in anguish. I feel like an exposed nerve, Remus, and it's, it's agony, because all of this, it's not fair. It's not. All of it is just wrong. Remus looks pained. I know. I'm not the first, Sirius whispers, his eyes prickling with building heat, and he's so tired of crying, too. He's fucking exhausted with having things to cry about. That's the thing, isn't it? I'm not the first to have a brother in the arena, or a best friend. Regulus and James did it first, didn't they? But it's not just them, either. It's it's everyone. Brothers and sisters, lovers, mothers and fathers. Some that never got to be. How fucked is that, yeah? It's not fair. It's not. No, it's not, Remus agrees softly. Sirius shakes his head, and we just, we swallow it, we choke on it, year after year after year, because what else can we do? That's all we can do, and that's not fair either. He exhales harshly and curls his fingers into the counter. And I'm no better than anyone else. I'm what they made me. Sirius, Remus protests. No, no, I am, Sirius insists. Don't you get it, Remus? I play my part just like everyone else. This, I'm part of it. A victor. A fucking murderer that they turned me into. And I, I hate them. I hate them. I want to tear them all apart. I want to make them see what they've created. And I want them to die looking at it. I want them to choke on it. I want to choke the life out of them. All of them. 
every single sponsor and game maker and government official and fucking riddle. Remus's eyebrows pinched together. Do you think you're the only one? Do you think that makes you bad? Because if so, I am as well. In this, you're not alone. I, I just, I feel dangerous sometimes, Sirius chokes out, his face twisting. I scare myself most days. You don't scare me, Remus tells him. Sirius scoffs out a resigned laugh. Don't lie. Yes, I do. I, Remus pauses, then sighs. Yeah, all right, you do, just not in the way you scare yourself. I'm scared of how you make me feel sometimes, but never, never because of what I know you're capable of. I've seen you drenched in blood, Sirius. I still find you to be the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Did you back then? Sirius asks. When I was just a person on the screen, covered in blood, did you find me beautiful then? Remus is silent for a long moment. Then? No, I didn't. I was ugly, wasn't I? Sirius whispers. Yes, Remus says softly. Sirius shudders out a deep breath, wondering and always wondering how Remus forever knows what to say. Or maybe he's just perfect, and what he says is the truth. The exact thing that Sirius needs to hear. He wasn't beautiful when he was forged into a weapon, dripping in blood he never wanted to spill. He was ugly, 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 grotesque and misaligned. He would never want to be anything else when doing that. The Hallows found him beautiful, thought him beautiful before and after and during his violence. Still find him beautiful to this day, and for all the wrong reasons, for all the reasons he hates. He wasn't fucking beautiful. He was scared and dying and losing parts of himself he'll never get back. It wasn't something to marvel over. It was disgusting. It was something people should have never reveled in. It was something everyone should have been horrified by. If you were drenched in blood now, their blood, I would find you breathtaking, Remus murmurs. And that, well, that's something else. That's something much different, a very important distinction to make. Being forced into murder, into becoming what he is, that's an ugly process. But serious doing it himself... Being what he is out of revenge, or his personal perception of justice, well, that is different. Sirius is learning that choice and autonomy means something to Remus that it doesn't to most. Considering his position in the hallow, that makes sense. Individual identity and control over oneself, freedom and equality, that's important to him. He can find beauty in that, and Sirius didn't have that in the arena which is why he can't find beauty there. I don't want to be what they made me, Remus, Sirius admits. You're not, Remus tells him. You may think that you are, but that's not true. Maybe it shaped you. No, it did shape you, because there is no way around that. We are all altered by the hands that teach us layers to pain. Me and you and everyone. There is no escaping that, and trust me. I know how infuriating that is, but that's not all we are. You, Sirius, you're so much more. Don't doubt that. I don't. How can you not? Sirius, literally the day we met, you tried to take off my mask to let me breathe. If you were what you think they've made you into, you never would have done that. We wouldn't be talking right now if you weren't better than them. That's just... That was just the right thing to do, Sirius mumbles. It's barely anything. If I could do more, more? Remus laughs, high and sharp. Don't you dare. That was everything to me. Sirius's mouth snaps shut, swallowing thickly. Remus shakes his head ruefully, and Sirius feels his heart clench. Oh. Never undermine your impact again. Not to me, Remus tells him, low and firm, gaze sharp and piercing. Maybe it didn't mean much to you, but me? It was more than I've had in five years, and you've found ways to give me even more than that since you tried to take my mask off. And it's sometimes, serious. it makes me angry. Do you even know how frustrating it is that I, I can't give you anything back? 
I, I, you don't owe me anything, Sirius says, the one who's speaking gently now. And you've already given me so much. What I did, that's just quite literally the bare minimum. And I don't want you to, to praise me for it or feel indebted. You deserve that, Remus. You deserve to breathe, to speak, to have freedom and control, and so much more. You deserve better. Remus looks down at his hands, lips pressed into a thin line. His eyes drift shut. He doesn't say anything. It's immoral, Sirius continues quietly. What the hallow does to servants? Well, what the hallow does to a lot of people. I don't know your crime, Remus, and frankly, I don't give a toss what it is. You can tell me or you can never tell me, and that doesn't change that what you go through is just as fucked as what I do. It's not a competition, though the hallow would love it if it was. But I won't pretend like it doesn't matter just because they put you in a mask and treat you like you're a machine. I know they torture you, or they have before, and you don't talk about it outside of broad terms. But don't think for a second that I'm not aware. I'm not ignoring it. If I could kill them, it'd be for you, too. Remus's head snaps up as he sucks in a sharp breath. His, he takes an abrupt step closer to Sirius then immediately takes a solid step back before Sirius could even react. He blinks. Sorry, I was about to do something quite stupid, I think. That's, I, you can't say things like that, Sirius. It's, it's really, it's the truth, Sirius tells him. Yeah, well, give me a bit of warning next time, Remus mutters, blowing out a deep breath and widening his eyes comically as he reaches up to run his hand through his hair. Sirius's lips twitch. Sorry that, well, sorry that you feel like you had to stop. I'm not, it isn't, I'm just, again, you don't have to apologize for needing what you need, Remus says, dropping his hand. You need to not be touched right now. That's okay. It doesn't feel right, Sirius murmurs. James and Regulus are, well, it wouldn't feel right if I... Oh, well, that's something else entirely, Remus announces with a frown. Don't do that. You can't punish the hallow by punishing yourself. Sirius feels those words like a punch. Oh, that's... That hits hard. Because that's it, isn't it? That's what he does, because he's been shaped so much by the hallow and all that it's done to him that he feels like an extension of it. He wants to hurt it, so he hurts himself, because... He's already hurt, so why not? Because it's so much easier to hurt himself than anyone else. Letting yourself be comforted isn't wrong, Sirius. James and Regulus don't need or want you to suffer in solidarity with them. Remus cuts in, holding his gaze. Do you think that would make them feel better? They wouldn't want that. They would be comforted to know that you're comforted. It's... I... Sirius swallows harshly, struggling to explain his guilt with the mere thought. They're suffering, and so shall he. James would be devastated if he knew. Regulus, the last night after dinner, Regulus helped me clean up, Remus informs him, and Sirius's head whips around to focus on him, fully invested immediately. Remus's lips curl up. We talked a bit. He's really quite interesting to talk to, you know? Very blunt. I like that about him. Sirius softens helplessly. Yeah, he's brutal sometimes. It was intriguing to see the differences between you, and also how similar those differences are, Remus muses. He's blunt, like I said, but also very guarded. He gets his point across by just saying it, usually with sarcasm. You, on the other hand, are simply transparent. I... Sirius blinks. What? Sirius... You're as subtle as a brick to the face, Remus declares in fond amusement. You're guarded too, though, just not the same way as him. He shuts down, you lash out. But when it comes to getting your point across, you're just very honest and earnest and obvious. I can see right through you. Maybe that's just because I take the time to look. I'm not sure. But I don't think those are mutually exclusive. Do you... Like what you see? Sirius asks carefully. Remus raises his eyebrows at him. 
I can't tear my eyes away from you the moment you're within my line of sight. What do you think? So, you do? Yes, Sirius, obviously I do. Oh, good. That's, yeah, good. Sirius says, clearing his throat. Remus looks exasperated. I like what I see, too, when I look at you, I mean. I know, Remus tells him with a stifled laugh. As I said, you're not very subtle. His face softens when Sirius instantly starts blushing. Don't worry about it, yeah? And don't, don't try to change it. Don't try to change who you are, who you really are. I like you for you. Sirius bites his lip. Okay, now I really want you to touch me. And your guilt? To hell with it. My incessant desire for you has it in a chokehold currently. I'll deal with it later. Oh? Remus chuckles, then shakes his head. Well, I'm terribly sorry to delay your desire, but I have a point to make that will hopefully help with the guilt. And how do you make your points, Remus? Sirius asks, just on the verge of teasing. Remus arches an eyebrow. Shall I tell you, since you told me how I do, you're not the only one who's observant, you know? Go on then, give it a go. You make your point like you'll never get another chance, like it's life or death, like you only get one shot and you refuse to miss it. You make your point like you're arguing it before it's even a debate, and you know you're right. Remus stares at him, then purses his lips. Well, I am right, so... Sirius snorts, and Remus rolls his eyes. Right, and how exactly did you come to that conclusion? Remus... Sirius says slowly. You're the first servant who has removed their mask on their own, ever. You're the first to give their name immediately when asked. You're the first to sit down and have a meal with us. You're the first to keep taking your mask off on your own, because, ah, uh, well, who cares who does it if you'll be killed for it anyway, yeah? Those were your words, by the way. Was I wrong? You also poured a drink on someone, despite knowing you'd be punished for it. You called me sir just to fuck with me. You wanted me to touch you, so you literally just rolled on top of me and demanded I touch you. For fuck's sake, you got me to keep my clothes off the floor by being passive-aggressive. Well, it worked, didn't it? And now, literally just now, when I alluded to wanting to murder people, you essentially just told me to calm down because so do a lot of people, including you. Oh, and when I said I wanted to murder for you, you look like you wanted to eat me, and then you weren't even ashamed of responding like that. Actually, you scolded me, like I should have known that would rile you up instead of frightening you. I mean, Remus, I just, I say this with deep, deep admiration, but you're fucking mental. Hmm, well, sanity hardly gets results, Remus says, lips twitching when Sirius gazes at him with helpless affection. I like you so much. Sirius whispers fervently, feeling every inch of how true that is. He likes Remus so fucking much that he feels like he needs to just punch something. Yes, I know. Remus' smile grows, only more lovely when there is more to see. I do have a point to make still. I know, I'm dreading it. It's going to make me awfully emotional. I can already tell. Sirius murmurs with a sigh. Possibly. Remus admits, circling back, and nice try with the deflecting. I was telling you that I had a conversation with Regulus after dinner last night. He's fairly succinct, honestly, but I think we understood each other quite well. He said something, you know, about how you were going to have a hard time while he and James were in the arena. Sirius swallows harshly. Did he? He did, Remus confirms. He told me that I would make it easier because I'm important to you. Suppose he knows me better than I thought he did, Sirius says, and his voice cracks. Remus's expression is so soft. He asked something of me. He said he couldn't make me. He could only ask, and so he asked. Sirius, he asked that I would take care of you. A broken yet muffled sound escaped Sirius's throat. He traps it behind his teeth as much as he's able to, ducking his head forward as he squeezes his eyes shut. 
His heart stretches in his chest like it's waking up with a yawn and a shudder. It hurts a little bit and feels so indescribably nice because serious. Oh, he didn't even realize how desperately he wanted proof that his brother still cared about him until he got it. Because he didn't know until this moment. Regulus, who hadn't asked for anything since he was 15 years old, not from anyone, as far as Sirius knows. What he was asking for then wasn't from Sirius himself, but from James. Sirius remembers it, one of the few things that he can remember in that awful, awful time right after the arena. Please, Regulus said, his voice strayed. Please, just let me see him, James. Why can't I see him? James had sounded equally strained when he replied, I'm sorry, Reg. He's just, he isn't feeling well, is all. Really, he's sleeping a lot right now. When he feels better, he'll come see you, all right? Regulus made a low, frustrated noise that was dangerously close to tears. James, if you need to talk, fuck off. You're the last person I want to talk to. Give me an hour and I'll come by, James said anyway. Don't waste your time, Regulus had snarled in response, and then there was the sound of his footsteps stumping away. Sirius, at that point in time, was curled up in bed and dealing with a brief moment of lucidity. He hadn't moved out of bed other than to relieve himself in a week. James tried. Bless him, he really tried to coax Sirius out of bed. Tried to coax him to eat more, tried to coax him into a shower or coming down to see Effie and Monty, at least, if not Regulus or old friends, because he wasn't quite ready yet. It didn't really work. Sirius couldn't stand to be around anyone who wasn't James, and sometimes even that was very fucking difficult. This was before the drinks and drugs. He wouldn't discover them for a few more weeks yet. No, this was during the haze, where the only time he felt alive was when he woke up enough to wish that he was dead. When it was all nightmares and hallucinations. Ghosts in the corner of his eye. Gunther used to sit in the chair by the closet with a broken spare poking out of his skull until Sirius asked why James never seemed upset about the dead man in the room. James, upon learning what he meant, removed the chair from the room altogether. On that day, Sirius had come out of his daze at the genuine distress in Regulus's voice. Even then, even so smothered by his depression, he felt a spark at the thought that his brother needed him. That spark went out quickly as it formed, though, and when James swiveled away from the door to see him staring, Sirius turned over to stare at the wall instead. Regulus never made that request again. Regulus never made any request again after that especially not from Sirius. He hasn't asked for anything involving Sirius since, and yet he asked Remus for this, to take care of him. Why would he do that? Sirius chokes out. Because you're his brother. He wants you to be okay, and he wants you to be taken care of, Remus replies simply. I didn't, he wasn't okay, and I didn't take care of him, Sirius confesses, like he's confessing his greatest sin. I, I... After the arena? Remus asks. When you were likely dealing with insurmountable trauma and reintroduction into society, unrelated to the environment that you had no choice but to adapt to whilst in the arena, having to adapt in reverse isn't easy just because it was something you knew before. In some ways, I imagine it must have been harder. It was, Sirius chokes. Remus, it was so hard... It's still hard. Remus holds his gaze. I know he's your younger brother, but it isn't your job to take care of him. It's no one's job to take care of anyone unless they're a parent or quite literally getting paid to do it. Where were your parents, Sirius? Oh, them, Sirius says hoarsely, then gives a gruff laugh. Yeah, let's just say they were useless and move on. Did they mean well? No. They did not. They, well, before Regulus and I were ever in the arena, we knew what it was to be targets. Our parents, like I said, useless. But if you go past that, then I think the proper term is abusive. It's that stopped when we got older. 
by older I mean bigger, like when we look like men, they stop beating us, because it's easier to beat children who can't fight back. I, um, I put my mother through a wall, so, yeah, that's, that's when it stopped for us. You put your mother through a wall? Remus murmurs. She, Sirius closes his eyes, grimacing at the memory. I had gone over to, to see Reggie. It was after I moved out. Regulus and I weren't exactly speaking at the time, but I went to him anyway. Remus fills in. Sirius clears his throat. I try to. I went up to his room, and he was asleep, but I saw the bruise on his cheek. My lovely father, no doubt. Mother never left bruises. She was mostly verbally abusive, or slaps and scratches. And, well, I don't know. I can't really remember all of it. I, I do remember yelling at them, and them yelling back. Regulus woke up and came down to see what all the fuss was about. Tried to get me to leave. Told me I was making a mess where I shouldn't. Family drama, Remus muttered. You have no idea, Sirius tells him. She... I vividly remember her telling me that I couldn't tell them how to treat their son, and I told her that they weren't allowed to hurt him or me ever again. It had been nearly two years since I got out of the arena, but I was going right back there every night in my dreams. So I don't think it was an empty threat when I told her I'd kill them if they tried. My mother, because she is who she is, grabbed Regulus by the arm, too rough, and then... And then you put your mother through a wall, Remus says. And then I put my mother through a wall, Sirius agrees with a wary sigh, tossing up a hand. It was, I mean, it was just plaster, you know? The sort you can easily put your fist through. She was fine. I think I just frightened them, which is, well, well, Remus muses. I mean, it worked. I, Sirius blinks at him, then snorts. Um, yeah, it did. That's, you find out I put my mother through a wall, and you're just very calm about this information. It's hardly the, Remus stops, then seems to think twice, then clears his throat. Don't forget the important details, Sirius. You put your abusive mother through a wall in defense of your brother. It's not entirely unjustified. I feel like you're just excusing literally everything I do. I'm not excusing it. You're justifying it. Sirius points out. Remus squints at him. Well, if it's fucking justified. Yes, yes, but who's to say it is? I say. Aren't you biased? Shamelessly. Sirius laughs. Oh, you like me so much. Shamelessly, Remus repeats, gaze warm. It's enough to light Sirius up from the inside out. Right, well, this has given me the insight to you and Regulus, admittedly. It's, I feel it bears repeating, especially now, but it's not your job to take care of your brother or anyone. I can tell you want me to agree with this, Sirius informs him solemnly, but I just don't. I won't. It's my job. It's not, Remus argues, because of course he does, because he has a point to make. You were not brought into this world to take care of your brother or anyone else. And no one was brought into this world to take care of you. No one is required to take care of anyone else, Sirius. It, it is a choice to do that, or else there is no meaning to it. None. Remus? No, listen to me. The people I take care of here in the Hallow. Was I born to do this? No. It's an obligation. I am forced. I don't do it because I want to. I do it because I will die if I don't. James, I've seen him take care of you. Do you think he does that because he feels he has to? Do you take care of him because you feel you have to? Lily and I, we took care of one another by choice, not out of a sense of responsibility. When you put your mother through a wall, you didn't do that because you felt it was your duty as Regulus's brother. You did it because he was hurt, and it angered you, and because you refused to let either of you be hurt by the baguette. That all has a meaning. That's important. What you're saying about the meaning in it, that's all true. You're right, Sirius admits. It is important that people take care of each other on purpose, not because they're predestined to. 
I just, it just feels like, well, that's the thing, isn't it? I always made that choice to look after him, to take care of him, and then I couldn't anymore. And that wasn't a choice, Remus. I, I genuinely couldn't. You blame yourself for it, even while you're very aware that it's not your fault, Remus murmurs. His eyebrows furrowed. Sirius just shrugs, because, yeah, pretty much. I may be mental, but you're a mess, Sirius Black. Never denied that, Sirius says with a huff of laughter. Remus quirks a tiny smile. You've been taking care of your brother, and James, a lot recently. Is it by choice, though? You could not. No, Sirius declares simply. Well, there you go, Remus tells him, eyes soft. You made your choice, and no matter what the circumstances, that means something. Regulus, he made his choice too. He made the choice to ask that I would take care of you, because it means something to him that you were taken care of, even when it can't be him. And Sirius? Swallowing, Sirius whispers, Yeah? You're going to let me do this for him, Remus murmurs, holding his gaze. You're going to let me do this for him, for James, for you, and for me. And you're not going to feel guilty about it, because that takes what it means from all of us. Okay, Sirius breathes out, feeling like some sort of weight has just fallen off of him. Not very much, more like cutting the dead ends of your hair when they start getting tangled so much then relishing and how easy it is to run a brush through the strands afterwards. Do you still want me to touch you? Remus asks. Really, very much, yes, Sirius blurts out, then tries hard not to feel selfish for it. James wouldn't be upset. That ray of sunshine would be utterly delighted. Regulus? Well, he cares about Sirius and wants him to be taken care of, as it turns out, so... It's not as if he would be offended. Remus does touch him, then. Just reaches out to slide his hand up Sirius's arm, then tugs him close until he can wrap him up and hold him. Sirius sags into him with a deep exhale, closing his eyes as he returns the embrace. Sirius is like wet clay in Remus's hands, completely at his mercy and guidance. Something in him settles as soon as Remus is holding him like this. Like the most peaceful place in the world to be is in the circle of his arms. If there is really a paradise out there, if you die, Sirius wouldn't know if he was dead if he died in Remus's arms. Because nothing would change. He's found his paradise right here. Remus's lips graze his forehead, then press harder the moment Sirius sways into him. His heart thought of thumping away at the realization that it's a kiss. Remus is kissing his forehead, and then Remus is kissing his temple, and then Remus is kissing the corner of his eye, one hand slipping to the back of his neck to guide him into tilting his face up. Sirius does, and then he is rewarded for his compliance by Remus kissing his cheek. He doesn't go any further than that, though, for which Sirius is grateful. Not tonight. Not now. Maybe not ever, because Sirius can't handle that right now. With his brother and best friend in the arena, with them suffering and him knowing it. He just can't do it, and he's so thankful that Remus seems to just know that and respect it. He pushes for Sirius to let himself be comforted, and that's all. Nothing else. For right now, Sirius can handle that, but only just. I must say, Sirius whispers, I feel very taken care of right now. Remus laughs, that lovely laugh of his, and folds forward to bury his face into Sirius's shoulder and hair. Sirius presses a smile against his cheek and lets himself be held. 